I don't have the wrong information on that. Evening. My name is Mike Viteri. I'm a licensed land surveyor representing the applicants. And um, the, parcels in, the parcels in question are um, original lot, Mr. Romeo's, is 2.403 acres. Okay, it's 2. And Mr. and Mrs. Pasquarelli's lot, original lot, was 2.610 acres. Okay. It's in a uh, RC, RC5 zone, uh, which none of the lots in this subdivision are uh, of that size, the uh, required five acre lot. Right. It's size. an old subdivision, it's a, which was done quite some time ago. Yes, it was 1973 subdivision. <coughs> She'll find it in the district. Correct. Yeah. And I, I, I had a discussion with John Lyons on this, just so I'll go into that. You can't expand it, you can't reduce the size of an uncomplying lot. Well, actually, I anyway, you, can't, you can get it by variance, you can. <coughs> and I'll explain why. Oh, yeah, by variance, you can. By variance, yeah. Yeah, which means the proceeding here is right. not time. Right, well, but they probably don't know that, but they will know that soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Please continue. Right. I'm sorry. This application actually uh, involves a site plan review, a area variance, and a uh, work variance within 100 feet of an existing stream. Uh, the site plan review will uh, involve <coughs> acceptance of a pool that has been constructed prior to the survey, which we found out that was near or over the property line. Uh, the intention is to move the property line so to include the uh, pool deck, the berm, and uh, proposed fencing and planting. The uh, area variance will be an exchange of land uh, of 0 0.118 acres, which the Pascarellis will convey to Romeo. Uh, the stream variance uh, also involves the existing house because it was built prior to this uh, requirement and um, so what we're looking for from the board at this point is just a uh, preliminary acceptance of the lot line change and we will move forward with the uh, area variance and the uh, site plan review and the uh, stream 100 foot adjacent uh, problem. Okay. I guess Perhaps at this point, I'll, I'll just this, give you an update on the discussion I had with John Lines. John Lines is the attorney for the planning board. Both of the lots are currently non-conforming. Yes. And through going through this process, one will be even more non-conforming since it's giving land to one of the others. And the planning board's not authorized <coughs> to either create a non-conforming lot or increase non-conformity. But because the... Uh, area and bulk regulation referred to, and let's say the five acre district is five acres, is actually in the zoning law, the Zoning Board of Appeals is authorized to give a variance to allow that greater nonconformity to be created on, I guess, Mr. Pascarelli's lot. And I don't think I saw, and I might have missed this too, an application to the ZBA for that area variance to permit that greater nonconformity to be created on Mr. No, Michael, is there? A, there is an application. Uh, I thought it was. I thought it was setbacks that were no, applied no, there's, for. There's a copy of an app. Well, there's a copy of an application that uh, points out uh, the current acreage and the proposed acreage. That uh, application uh, uh, was is dated September. Th I don't know the, whether it's been pro it hasn't been processed by the ZBA. It was dated. The copy that was in the file was dated September 30th, and it was signed by the Pascarellis. Uh, but uh, there's no record. There's it, nothing's been processed at this point in time, right, Joan? By the by the ZBA, uh, this is the same sort of situation as uh, our prior discussion. Was. It's a little more more, uh, more grievous here. Uh, the planning board is totally powerless uh, here to uh, deal with the proposed uh, lot line alteration unless the ZBA were to grant. Uh, the variance to allow the non-complying lot to be reduced, mm -hmm. the non-complying lot, which is not Mr. Rump, uh, no. to be reduced in area, the Pascarelli lot to be reduced in area. Uh, and until the uh, additional lands uh, through the subdivision process, until the, that relief were granted and the planning board were to authorize the annexation uh, through the subdivision process, uh, the planning board 
uh, is powerless to act upon the applications for special use permit or site plan approval because the improvements in question uh, are located on currently on Pascarelli's land and not Mr. Romeo's land. Further, uh, I, I see in um, uh, uh, in some brief notes from uh, Ron uh, Evangelista, the uh, code enforcement officer, that he may be uh, he says there may be additional issues, uh, not only with respect to uh, where those improvements are located uh, on uh, the adjoining property, but also the proximity of some of those improvements, I think specifically the pool pavilion, among others, uh, to the uh, lot line uh, on the Romeo site uh, with respect to setbacks, which would also have to be addressed uh, by the ZBA. Uh, so, um, you know, the bottom line here is I think uh, uh, the planning board uh, can look at this situation, uh, understand what uh, the issues are, uh, some of which are certainly self-created, um, and uh, advise the applicant and his representatives to uh, work uh, with the ZBA to try to uh, secure the variances. to secure the relief that's necessary for the uh, for the planning board applications to uh, to proceed. I spoke with Ron, and uh, Ron mm -hmm. said that this would be uh, worked out. Simultaneously, he thought, and uh, speed up the process by attending the planning board meeting and at least having your input to uh, advise the CBA what you thought of the process. And, uh, well, we can do them. We we would handle them both concurrently, assuming both the ZBA has accepted the applications for the variances you require. Uh, you, can, you you can't even do that, Michael. No. The, the, the difference in this particular case is that the improvements that are being. Uh, the, the approvals that are requested for improvements by Mr. Romeo, uh, in other words, the site plan and the special use permit, are for improvements that are, in most cases, already situated on property other than his own. So he can't, he can't in fact, apply for, those for approval of those improvements, but they're not on his property <laughs> on, until, uh, the, until the subdivision is affected. That's a good one. That's the first time we bumped into that. Yeah, but, but, Aren't you glad you showed up? <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's, the improvements are already in place, too. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. What right. variances are being applied for right now? Uh, the area variance, the uh, stream, adjacent 100 foot stream. Well, that's a, that's a planning board. That's a planning board <clears throat> special permit. That's not that's a special variance. use permit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the variances that are required are essentially to. Uh, uh, um, and apparently others have been submitting paperwork, uh, Mike, this, and, and not you. Uh, the the variances that are required are variance to allow the Pascarelli property to be downsized. And secondly, whatever variances are required uh, to address deficient setbacks that may have been created by Romeo with the improvements on his property. Does the pavilion exist? Yes. It does exist. I believe it exists, according to. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so. About and, and that's no. that's the, that's the one of the setbacks that's in question. I think Ron has indicated that that building may be 13 feet from the lot line, and it needs uh, to be more. The than building that. hasn't been constructed yet. That's a proposed pavilion. Okay, okay then it's the location. The pool is constructed. The uh, pool deck, the berm, mm -hmm. which we have the setbacks. We had one right up the street where we they yeah. put in a uh, <clears throat> couple oil tanks too close to the road or something. Yeah. Setback. Uh, what about the fence? The fence hasn't been constructed yet either. But the fence will need a variance as well. Doesn't that have to be set back? The fence, uh, it can be along the property line. On the property? I believe a property along along a property. I believe it can be along a property line. I've never seen a setback for a fence in our law. Pretty that, sure there is. That's why you can do it at the perimeter. Well, I know a number of communities do either for maintenance purposes or things like that. The only one I know of a fence setback is along the roads, uh, county roads, 15 feet back for snow removal and things like that. It seems that the, there are two ways to approach this. Either uh, have get the sub, <laughs> get the variance so you can get the subdivision done so he owns the property that the improvements are on that he needs the permits for, or pos possibly if Mr. Roy and Mr. Pascarelli uh, jointly applied for the special use permit and site plan for those things, since but I don't think that seems a little overly complicated. It seems what they really have to do is somehow he's got to get control of the property. He's got to get control of the and the only way to do that is to get the variance from the ZBA, so you can then come back to... Uh, the one thing we could do, we could accept a application for the consolidation of 
the, the lot line transfer, assuming the ZBA accepts an application yeah, for the... But you don't even know at this point in time, and I don't think uh, Mr. Vetter can, uh, can uh, substantiate whether a proper application has even been filed with the ZBA. Mm, we no, know I don't. That there, we know that there's in the file a piece of paper that's dated September 30th, signed by the Pascarellis, and we don't know any, I don't know anything beyond that. Yeah. Do you know, Joan? No. That was submitted. Yeah, but we don't know. Is there some reason? Yeah, the, the, the bottom line appears to be that if it were submitted on September 30th, <coughs> it would have, by this time, been processed, uh, been, been processed by the ZBA. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that has not, has not happened. I think what we're going to have to ask you to do is come back on the 15th of December, hopefully, well, maybe not even that. I think the first thing you need to do is go to the ZBA get the variance to allow the one lot to be made more non-conforming and both Mr. Pas Mr. Pascarelli is going to actually have to do that because it's his land and then once that's done then the application for the subdivision can come before the planning board once that lot line alteration is is taken as takes place and Mr. Mr. Romeo then owns the property which has the improvements on it now which are currently in violation currently on his neighbor's property then the planning board could accept an application for the special use permits and site plan to basically legit legitimize what he is doing also at that time you'd probably need further variances from the ZBA in terms of setbacks <coughs> That you'd need to meet. Or modifications in the plan. Or, well, you can't. They, no, the plan can't be modified. Well, I, the plan might be able to be modified. I think uh, you just indicate the pool pavilion, as a for instance, doesn't does not currently exist. So the plan right. could be modified with right. respect to the location of the pool pavilion to. to but move. the pool's not going to move. Uh, no the pool. Well. Well, no, the pool's not going to move. So they'd be submitting a plan that basically said there's a pool there, we're just going to alter the lot line, period. No, nothing else. Well, I think the first thing they have to do is at least get the subdivision process completed yeah. so that at least Mr. Romeo owns all the property that the existing improvements sit on so that he can then apply for the special permit to allow him to have those there. Does because it make any sense to have both, of the, both the applicant and the neighbor do this jointly in front of the ZBA so that they can explain? Well, they're probably going to have, I think it's Mr. Pascarelli who's going to have to apply for the variance to the ZBA because it's his lot that's going to get smaller. Yeah, that's been, and that's, that's the variance. Who would contact me that that's uh, that I'm on the agenda? What I would suggest you do is call tomorrow morning and ask to speak to the ZBA secretary because she will be in tomorrow morning after 9 o'clock. And she can tell you what's happened to that. Uh, we can't. Uh, we don't know what they're doing. Well, we don't. Yeah, we know what they're doing down there. We just don't. Yeah. But anyway, give her a call. She'll know what happened with that. <laughs> She'll know what happened down there, uh, because that's the that's the key. We, the planning board, as Art points out, and this is the first time I think we have faced this. We can't. That's why I submitted Yeah. The uh, the materials are. You know, uh, if these issues can be can be you know. Again, if the subdivision matter can be taken care of, yes. the rest of the submitted materials submitted uh, are, are adequate. We can work, we can move forward, from yeah. Forward. But, but he just uh, has to own all the property. He's asking for permission to do things on, or permission to allow the things he's already done there to remain there, I guess and, is the way I should put it. because of the uh, configuration of these parcels, the normal, the normal solution in a case like this to avoid the need for variance, et cetera, uh, that can't uh, can't be applied, which is normally just mm -hmm. a, 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 a land, an equal land swap between the parties, and therefore nobody becomes a more more non-conforming or less non-conforming. But the way but it can't happen here, right. in, in terms of you know, uh, there's no way that Mr. Romeo can give uh, the Pascarellis uh, an equivalent amount of land uh, that's contiguous to theirs. No, I'm um, ask the embarrassing question. Unless he were to acquire a piece of the uh, property to the rear. The one up in the front, all the way over to the driveway. Yeah. How did a building yes. permit get issued? What? How did a building permit Good get question. issued? I have no idea. When Something I, tells me it never wasn't issued. I'm not sure. When I was, what happened is when I was currently doing what I was doing these last months is when I first went and saw this on the property. And there, I could find no documentation. Uh, permitting what I saw was there. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I there was some type of no. site plan submitted prior to me getting involved with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, w w when did they bring you in? When, <laughs> uh, and when did you become involved, if when I could ask? Uh, 
September. Okay. September 9th yeah, my days. my visit there was I think in May or June. Yeah. So that predates, yeah, that predates, yeah, <coughs> predates your <laughs> involvement. So I, I guess think the question the, is when was when actually was the pool installed? I don't know. All I know is when I was there, it was there with water in it, <laughs> <laughs> and the berm was there. So. How was the swim? Was it pretty good? Uh, I forgot my trunks, and I thought there might be certain obscenity laws I would otherwise violate. So far, I, I didn't. <coughs> But I think you're, I really think your next step is to call <coughs> Brennan, who's the ZBA secretary, tomorrow morning and find out what happened with Mr. First of all, find out if they have Mr. Pascarelli's letter and actually what's in it, what he actually applied well, I for. I submitted everything. I'm, I'm representing Pascarelli. Okay. 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 <laughs> Excuse yeah. me, Michael. I believe he just said that he submitted to the zoning board and the planning board at the same time. The, the, it would not have made it to a zoning board agenda yet. But he said the letter went on September 30th. He just said that he submitted to the planning board and zoning board at the same time. Oh. Yeah, the whole package. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, at the same time. Okay, then included, included in that package of information then is, a, uh, is an application to the ZBA dated September 30th signed by the Pascarellis. So that's included in that package. That was submitted to the planning board okay. at planning board closed agenda okay. and the zoning board at the same time. Okay, so we keep, okay. And that was for great greater nonconformity on, on the Pascarelli's lot? I would have to go forward. You have the, the entire packet there. I do? But what, I, what I'm saying to you is that the zoning board and the planning board at the same time submitted to the zoning board and the planning board closed agenda and the zoning board at the same they were both submitted the same day. Okay, and I just want to know Two what the application to the ZBA was asking for. Because well, that's, that's what we need to know. If, if Actually, I recall, I recall, I recall, I recall, I recall Michael, the, the entry no. on, on page one of the application reads lot line alteration or lot line revision and then states the two acreages mm -hmm. existing and proposed. Technically, it's not the line, line alteration that's being approved by the ZBA. It doesn't the, change anything. It's the variance, no. it's the variance with no. respect to uh, area. But it doesn't change anything. No, it doesn't change anything. I think, I think the, the thing that needs to be done is a phone call downstairs. Lot line revision. Oh, you got a copy of it? Well, this is what we're going about, right? Uh, oh, that's the EAF, but there's a... Uh, I get the site plan review you, you have a, application. Is there, is, there a is, there a, is there a ZBA application there, Richard? ZBA application there. No? Okay. <clears throat> Why the They're meeting Wednesday night in two nights. But if you're not on the agenda... But if you're not on the no. agenda, that's why I call them tomorrow morning. Call Brennan tomorrow morning downstairs. I'm guessing it says uh, the same thing. The number is 876-6296. Okay, and ask her if the uh, variance applications for Romeo and Pascarelli are on the agenda. If they're not on the agenda, have they received them? And specifically, you want to know if the Pascarelli application is to create a greater nonconformity on their existing lot which is in service of what is then the proposed lot line alteration with their neighbor, them giving some of their land, selling some of their land to their neighbor. That's what needs to happen so that we can then process the subdivision application so that then Mr. Romeo will own all the land that his improvements are on so he can then apply for the special use permit and site plan to basically legitimize those features. So, yeah, give Brennan a call tomorrow morning. All right. The next one looks a little more <laughs> a little less complicated. Okay. Linda Friedman, 12 Charles Street, Special Use Permit and Site Plan. Conduct of Sketch Plan Conference, Initial Presentation of Applications for Special Use Permit and Site Plan Approval under Town Code Chapter 125 Zoning for Front Porch Modification to a Single Family Dwelling in the Rhinecliff Hamlet, Rhinecliff Overlay Districts, the Hudson River National Historic Landmarks District, and the Town's LWRA, and lying within a thousand feet of the Hudson River, Planning Board Review for Completeness and Processing as may be timely under Town Code and Seeker. Uh, Mm. Hi there. If you could tell us what you all want to do. 
Um, it's hard. But we won't, they won't be able to hear you at home because of the microphone. My name is Linda Friedman from 15 Charles Street. And uh, at the present time, we have a small balcony above our front porch. That's just the that's that's just that's not important, but I don't. If you want to look at it, it's okay. <laughs> I do. Oh, it's okay. I'll probably go down the other end. And get I don't it. mind. <laughs> we'll send it, it back, walls Richard. And things like we'll that. send it back. <laughs> Continue. Continue. Oh. So there's a little model that my husband made, and then we would just oh. like to go to the previous old-fashioned tiny sloped roof, no balcony, uh, over uh, the existing front porch. <laughs> no, so it's an approximate model. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Everybody good enough? Yep. Yep. I'm good. Nice. Any kids that are going to get dollhouses for Christmas this year? My kid. Very nice. Okay. Um, any questions by members of the planning board? Yeah. I think this one's pretty straightforward. Um, thank you okay. <laughs> for that. Take this I have a resolution. Yeah, no, you can grab that. I, I, just, I think it's great that you're, you're rendering it. Now the whole ceiling comes out in the porch and everything. So you're going to redo it? Yes, yes, yes. Nice. Okay. Yes, thank you. I have, a, I have a resolution here I will read. <clears throat> and read as written. Yeah, I know. But we're going to read away the whole bunch of stuff. Okay. The Town of Rhinebeck Planning Board, upon review by the Zoning Enforcement Officer, hereby acts as follows on the application by Linda Friedman for special use permit permits uh, RCO district and work within 1,000 feet of the Hudson River and site plan review and approval under Town Code Chapter 125 zoning in the matter of a proposed removal of a balcony railing and building of a pitched roof over an existing front porch of a dwelling at 15 Charles Street in the Hudson River Hamlet and Overlay Districts, the Hudson River Historic Landmarks District and the Town of Rhinebeck Local Waterfront Revitalization Area, all is depicted within a submission made on November 3rd, 2014, uh, including a sketch and materials list, a full EAF, excuse me, Part 1, and a coastal assessment form. Accepts the application is adequate for commencing review by the Planning Board, the Board's consultants, and the public. Classifies the proposed a action as a Type 2 action under seeker involving a limited modification to an existing dwelling for which further environmental review is precluded. Three, schedules a combined public hearing as set forth within the next notice of public hearing on the applications for Monday, December 15, 2014 at 6.45. Yes. I think that's what we need, 6.45. And directs the clerk to undertake and or otherwise cause noticing and posting thereof in strict accordance with the provisions of Town Code Chapter 125 Zoning, Section 12566 and Section 12577. Delegates planning board members. I'll take it. I'll take it. Woody and, yeah. and Sharon. Okay. Need some contact information. Just how you can be get. How can I reach you? To, con to conduct a field visit, report their observations at the public hearing. Five seven eight nine one two one. It would be in your best interest in case somebody has some questions. Now, are you normally available through the week? Can you call me? No. Oh, yes, when yes. we make the site review, oh, we see. should, you should be there, or somebody, one representative of yours should oh, be there. Oh, okay. You Are you call? normally in the area during the week? No. Oh boy. So I, I would, you need to know in advance. Okay, because I got a, I got a drop dead problem because I'm, gonna, I'm out of town for two weeks in, in December. Sure, I can go. I can. I mean, I can go on a weekend. Okay. Are you are you good on a weekend? Yeah, I'll do it a week. Okay. It'll be real. It'll be up short. Very, It'll be a quickie. Very yeah. So this is it's going to be a drive by. Kind of like the Williams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, they will call. They will call you and schedule it. They'll call and schedule with you, so it's convenient. I mean, I can't imagine there's going to be. They're taking what it is a, a, a real leak, totally terrible approach to building and everything. And just drive by slow. Something back that's authentic. Just drive by slow, and you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. Refers the application to the town conservation board for review and comment. Refers the application to the town historian for review and comment. Refers the application to the town water <coughs> advisory committee for review and recommendation as the consistency with the pertinent town coastal policies is set forth in the town's local water revitalization 
program. Eight, refers the applications to the Dutchess County Department of Planning and Development pursuant to section 239 of the General Municipal Law. Nine, without prejudice, the <coughs> requirement for careful consideration by the planning board of any input that arises through the continuing review process set forth above authorizes the planning consultant to prepare the working draft of an approval resolution under the town code for consideration by the planning board when and if timely. Could I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Very good. They will call you and for your convenience to schedule a, the site visit. And it'll be, you know, like two minutes. It'll be a quickie. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving right along. Uh, Mensch Grassmere LLC, Mill Road and New York State Route 9 South, sketch plan proposed phase one Grassmere Farms Country Inn 2. As set forth the agenda, wait a minute, that's the wrong one. Hold the phone. Okay. Mensch Grassmere LLC, Mill Route and New York State Route 9 South, site plan. Conduct of sketch plan conference with the planning board for initial presentation of site layout and development <coughs> components. Plan for phase one of Grassmere Farms Country Inn 2, situate within a 250 acre tract in the Rural Agriculture District, the Hudson River National Historic Landmarks District, and the town's LWRA, and as, su and as subject of seeker statement of findings issued on March 13, 2013, and special use permit granted with conditions on April 7, 2013, with application submission anticipated for January 2015. And thank you. Thanks. For the uh, board's information, uh, we had a, a very brief uh, pre-submission conference uh, this afternoon. Uh, I shared with uh, the applicant uh, uh, the comments I set forth in my meeting notes, and uh, they will all be addressed as part of their January. So I'm not going to repeat those uh, uh, this evening. Great, well thank you. Uh, what we wanted to do tonight was, we've been working on this since we received the special use permit, and it's very similar in a lot of ways to what you guys have seen before, but we've made some some changes with respect to some of uh, how we're looking at some of the different components um, and where some of the different pieces lay out on the site, and we've also identified what we're considering to be phase one of the project. Um, so we wanted to come back tonight and to uh, sort of reacclimate you with where we were and then um, give you an overview with, uh, with where we've been going with it and make sure that everybody was comfortable with the approach uh, before we submitted the entire uh, site plan review package um, in January. Uh, so just to bring everybody, uh, to jog everyone's memory, <laughs> this is a familiar document at one point. This was, this is the, uh, this is the existing site plan, or this is the site plan that we had submitted as part of the seeker review process. Uh, this is the manor house right here. Uh, these are the stone barns right here, and uh, there's a series of outbuildings that were around the estate grounds, um, and then uh, eco cabins, uh, pond cabins, uh, thank you, that, uh, that went around the outside of these, uh, the estate ponds, the existing estate ponds up here. Uh, and at the time, we had, uh, including a lodge, we had included a lodging building, a coach house building, which, served, which uh, contained lodging units right here, and the spa was contained right there. Um, and the stone barns uh, were to be turned into a restaurant uh, facility with an adjacent event, uh, an event facility next to that. Uh, this here is what we're considering to be phase one of the project, which includes about se which includes about 75 lodging units. It's a similar layout in that there are uh, there are, uh, are a series of, of buildings that form in a certain way wings around the outside of the Grasmere property um, or the estate grounds of the property. Uh, we've got an an, ele an elevation illustration, which I'll bring. Uh, I'll show you in a second. Um, but what we've done is we've really broken that down, and we've created a walled garden that runs around the outside of the uh, outside of the estate grounds, and we're building these buildings actually within that uh, within that construct right here. Uh, do you have that, John? I'll, I'll start with that. This is how this works. Uh, so really, the the buildings are integrated into the almost into the wall itself. So if you're looking at at the wall from the outside, you would it would read like a wall. With then this almost being an addition to it. So periodically along this wall garden, you would see the the sort of outside of the building. On the inside, it would read more like a like a a manor cottage. Uh, but on the outside, we'd really look to integrate it into the walled structure. So you actually enter into that, and then you enter up into the building. Uh, and that's a way that we found to introduce new buildings 
into the estate vocabulary in a way that uh, it, it gave it, a, I think, a little bit of a kick uh, and also gave them a sense of place. That was one of the, the areas that we'd really struggled with in the past is how do we add anything around Grasmere that isn't either completely derivative in a way that didn't feel authentic or something that was modern that felt like too much of an intrusion into the situation. Um, so this was a way that we, we found to strike a balance. Um, with respect to the other components of the of the project, what we've done is we had the spa down here. We actually moved the spa building up to this area here to take it out of this uh, sort of this zone. Um, and then we added a carriage house building over here, which contains a smaller number of lodging units. This is only six lodging units. Um, the larger spa building sits up here. This is replaced by uh, by some of these outbuildings, all of which just contain uh, contain uh, uh, guest lodging units. And then we've identified as as part of phase one. Uh, 10 of the pond cottages that would be built um, along here. And this is representative. These are being worked on uh, at the moment. Um, then the last element here, well, there's actually two others. The, the, fir the second to last element is a series of garden cottages. And these are probably wooden buildings, smaller buildings that would uh, sort of sit, the, the land drops down uh, in this direction. And they would be built sort of into the topography and then uh, landscaped into the grounds. Uh, the last are these two, these two, we're calling them, um, uh, they're sort of manor out buildings, but they'd be three story buildings which would serve to bookend uh, the outside of this area. Uh, it would be one unit per floor, um, but the these top units especially would have great views out over the field. So we're looking at these as really probably the highest end of, of the different units that are on the site. Uh, and then the last component, which, which, <laughs> which <laughs> surprised it wasn't my phone, uh, that, uh, is the stone barns. And it, what we're doing with the stone barns as part of phase one is just turning it into an event space. Uh, we'd be finishing out the barns, adding the systems, um, putting uh, the windows in so they'd be winterized, and, and uh, we'd, we'd get rid of this opening here, which, uh, which would soundproof these buildings, um, and just using them for meetings during the week and then events during the weekend. Uh, we wouldn't be building the third entrance uh, to the property because we wouldn't be in using this as a public restaurant, which was, was the original plan. Um, it would just be used as events. So all of the event traffic would then enter in off of Route 9 here uh, into the property. And this would also contain all of the service and all of the staff entrances. Um, and then the guest entrance only, this is the same as it has been. The guest entrance would be in here and then the guests would exit out onto Route 9 this way. The only, the only difference is that we're not adding this third entrance and exit for the stone barns because we're not, uh, we wouldn't be building the, uh, the public restaurant. Questions for, for Jonathan? Yeah, I, one of the things I noticed, your parking situation has changed dramatically since your original proposal. You, my understanding is you were going to have uh, basically cars over here and everybody was basically foot traffic. Now, now I, or some sort of conveyance on site, now I see a whole bunch of parking spaces by these various living units. Yeah, well, we've tried to keep it still to the outside. The, we, we've added a, a parking area up in here, although we had some parking up there before. All of the staff parking is still out here. And we're, we're looking to that area to absorb the vast majority of it. What we did add is uh, some smaller areas of, uh, of parking right along here, um, which would be for some of these buildings right in here. There's also a small parking area in there. We, we tried to keep it minimal. Uh, it's really an operational issue in the context of, of it became too expensive to, to look at trying to valet park absolutely everybody. Um, we would probably look to have some kind of valet park parking component to events, um, because especially the larger events. Um, one of the questions that we're working on is uh, is how we're not showing, and I want to just make sure everybody's aware of this, we're not showing any parking right now down by the stone barns. That's a work in progress. We may have to add some parking down here by the stone barns, uh, so people would come in for events, and some people might head down here, particularly people that, that um, for whom mobility was an issue. Um, but that's something that we're trying to work through right now. Jonathan, you used the word events. I assume that's stone barn related, and what other events would you have that would require the rest of the site? It's really stone barns related. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, looking, we're looking at this area as really being the event area. And, and it, it actually works out pretty nicely in this context because it's in the same dynamic that existed before. It's at a little bit of a remove from the rest of the property. Um, but what we're not doing is just adding the public restaurant at the main barn space. We're using that as, a, as just event space. 
the questions. Where do they park now for events? Uh, right now, the uh, parking is just up along driveway areas, and if people have, if there's events, a lot of times it's a shuttle, um, because most people that that uh, stay will stay down at the Beekman Arms or stay in Poughkeepsie, and uh, any any event that happens, a lot of times will be just a shuttle will run from from one of those places down to the Stone Barns. Um, for the Rhinebeck Science Foundation event, that that's the one that has the biggest number of cars. Um, that one, people park essentially all the way along the drive going all the way up. Um, we keep them off the roots of the nice trees and do some, but it, it, you know, the drive's about a half mile, so it can park a good number of cars, and then it comes all the way down. Um, there's some staff parking usually up by the, uh, up by the, uh, uh, the shed out building. And look, is that a new road that you're putting in there on the upper left where that the carriage new. house is? Yes, yes, and we had that on the old plant too. Um, it's just, it serves to loop around. The idea is that, um, yeah, this is this is what we'd shown earlier. But with this, uh, in this one, the parking was all, it was just one single row of it that went up. Uh, we moved it with the carriage house building, so it was back um, in a sort of more defined area. But the idea is that, that, um, that if somebody was leaving and was picking up their car in particular, they could come this way and then head around the outside and head out that way. I'm looking at the spa and the parking for the in the area of the spa. I think that, in my opinion, depending on how many people you have at that spa, that's a very small number. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. Up here on East on Route Nine, uh, that small one building operation, there's cars parked all over the place. Yeah, and that, that's something that we're going to be looking at in more detail. It, this was uh, this was sort of a placeholder. Okay. Um, we we have the ability, you know, we have the extra parking here, so there is that. But I I'm, I, I agree with you. That's something that we're going to want to take a look at. That's changed. I like that quad approach in the, around the <coughs> mansion. Mm -hmm. It's nice. <coughs> Other questions? I'll it when you're done. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> we also still have the parking for here. I think these are all, uh, Jonathan, I think these are all nice refinements. Thank you. You know, I think, um, you know, I know you've looked at it a million times and you must be thinking there can't be more um, changes, but, but Every time we look at it, I think it gets better and stronger. Thanks. Well, I, I'm I'm sure we're not uh, we're not totally done yet, <laughs> but I, I thought it was important. This was this is actually especially around this area. We I, I, this is the thing I've liked of all everything that we've looked at. I, I like this far and away the most. Um, so I think we're I think we're at the very least uh, honing in on it, <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll get there. Is there anything further you need for us before you're ready to prepare your actual application? No, I, I really wanted just to make sure that, um, you know, as we're trying to sort of further define this, that we weren't looking at things, and that we really didn't, that we didn't miss something. Okay. That we weren't, you know, then going to go down the road on something, and, and then we wish we would have gotten some feedback uh, earlier in the process. So I wanted to give everyone a chance to look at this and, and, and consider the framework that we're, you know, that we're, uh, that we're working on at the moment, and then we'll, we'll further define it um, in advance of uh, the full submission. Good, thank you. Yeah. Thank okay. you both very much. <laughs> Good work. Appreciate it. We were having that conversation, <laughs> particularly with the, yeah, the meeting change to the first Monday. Oh, yeah. oh gosh. We stole a couple of weeks of his time. Okay. Um, gardens at Rhinebeck Phase 3, Gardenway to Astor Drive Site Plan. Conduct of Sketch Plan Conference with the Planning Board for initial presentation of proposed modifications in site layout and development components plan for 92-unit Phase 3 in the Rural Agricultural RA-10 District as subject of special use permits, wetland permits, and site plan approval granted by the Planning Board on September 19th, 2011 for this grandfathered use with application submission anticipated for January 2015 meeting. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hi, David. How are you? Nice, David. Very well. Very well. Um, if you remember, um, 
we came back in phase two to go ahead and make a couple of alterations. There was the garbage. Remember, we had originally a big refuse area. We decided to go individual. We wanted to do the same thing on phase three. Um, we also went ahead and had decks proposed um, on, on, on two in, um, in the back of the B buildings. And we wanted to go ahead and do that again here. Um, on phase three. And then also, um, I'm like during the whole sales uh, I'm like process, we realized that the single story unit was selling um, like a lot better than the two story unit. So we went ahead and went ahead and put in um, not more, but replaced the corner B units with C units. So we have. Um, yeah, we uh, uh, like we actually impacted nine buildings, and we added <coughs> you know, a lot more C units than we have B and A units. So we feel that moving forward, the clientele that we're selling to will, you know, it's going to be a lot better for them. It's just one story, no stairs. Uh, Anything to add? Yeah. So does that mean you you decreased your square overall square footage? No. Um, basically, uh, um, if you remember the. The approval was based on really bedroom count. Mm -hmm. yes. You only have a certain amount of bedrooms. 159. So we went ahead and we took the two bedroom <coughs> story and replaced it with a two bedroom, bedroom one story. story. So it has a bigger, slightly bigger footprint. Yes, it has okay. a slightly bigger okay. footprint. We, uh, we also made a few other minor modifications. Uh, my name is Chris Lapine with the Chase and Companies. Uh, the existing building, which was on Heather Way, uh, we had proposed to uh, keep that. Uh, at this stage, it's proposed to be demoed and rebuilt, uh, similar to the other uh, uh, units for this uh, phase. Uh, that was the model unit. That was the model. The model. model. Right. right. So. <laughs> the question just popped up. Is it, it's not a historic building <laughs> yet, is it? <laughs> <laughs> a couple more years. Oh. If you remember, we actually shot a movie there. So oh. if you go inside, it was like a big horror movie. <laughs> so there's blood and everything is all torn <laughs> up in there. So it would be better if we took it down. <laughs> Not saleable as it is. N not as it is. No. <laughs> <laughs> People probably would have bought it. There were some issues about construction yeah, I mean, quality it, as well. It, it just doesn't pay. Yeah. Um, just doesn't pay to keep it. In accordance with the original ZBA uh, resolution for the overall gardens at Rhinebeck Phase Three. Uh, in adding these additional C units, uh, we maintained a 50-foot setback between all the buildings. So some of the buildings slightly shift, but we stayed within the overall limit of disturbance that was outlined as part of the original approval mm -hmm. so that we wouldn't impose upon the uh, wetland permits that were issued for this project, both the special use permit and the town wetland permit. Uh, and right now what we're looking for is some direction as to how to proceed with an amended site plan approval in terms of amended applications and site plans. Basically, that's basically is what you're looking for is to amend the site, the site plan. plan. If there's no additional intrusion into wetland buffers, anything like that, I don't. You don't need to amend the uh, your wetland permit. Um, obviously, the special use permit is grandfathered from the ZBA, so that's not an issue here either. Um, I I would think it's just an amended site plan. What do you think, Art? I think it's a you know I agree it's, a, it's an amended site plan. Um, the only thing I think you need to document, Chris, is the, uh, uh, the minor extent of uh, additional impervious that's being created with the uh, with going to those, uh, those few uh, retouch there. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of the fact that uh, uh, the code enforcement officer has taken a quick look at the, uh, the plan, uh, recognizes that uh, this has been around for a while and he needs to uh, you know, get up to speed on the, uh, on the proposal. But he has suggested some. Uh, minor shifting of uh, various buildings That's right. uh, to further uh, reduce, um, oh, the, to basically further mitigate uh, wetland impact or wetland buffer impacts. Uh, I think uh, it's beholden for you folks to take a look at uh, Ron's suggestions in that regard. Uh, frankly, I think that uh, uh, some of the suggestions, uh, maybe perhaps many of the suggestions are not workable in violation of the uh, building setback, uh, building separation requirements and things that were set forth in the, in the special permit. 50 foot. But I think as uh, certainly uh, <clears throat> uh, if, if, if buffer impacts can be mitigated, uh, it would be good to do that. And uh, certainly as a courtesy, uh, the uh, comments made by the uh, uh, code enforcement officer need to be, uh, need to be entertained. Uh, you have beyond, a copy beyond of that? that? Beyond that, I, I took a look we, we at, don't. The, uh, at the submission and I have uh, 
Uh, no critical comments to, to offer, as Michael indicated, it's simply an amendment of the, uh, of the, of the approved site plan. And um, uh, you know, uh, we, did, we would uh, be in position, the board would be in position, considering a no consistency determination to go along with that. I'm sure Joni has a copy of, of Ron's letter about relocating, so you can get a copy from her. Um, and I think what Art's saying just... I, had, uh, I think I had a, in, in your, someplace along the way, I just had a few <coughs> comments about uh, something else in the uh, cover letter. Uh, Building 63, I think if you take a look at your cover letter, uh, is identified as moving from two different classifications. Yes, I saw that. I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, just, it's the last one. Just clarify that. But uh, you know, that, was, that was the most critical comment I could make. <coughs> Tonight, that's pretty good. <laughs> Which end will you start at? Um, we really have, well, the first thing we're going to start is, you know, uh, taking down the old models and putting those two buildings back. Uh, because the road's already in, there's a limited amount of construction that needs to be done, you know, in the ground to go ahead and get that finished. So we go ahead and sell from there and then start either the upper site or the lower site. Um, and we've basically broken it down after the two buildings into four sections. So each one of the bottom or upper sections has, has two different you know, sections to it. Half the road, then the other half of the road, and then move up to the top section. This is the point to us at this point. <laughs> Heads or tails? So I, I, I guess understanding the process, then we would get a copy of uh, both Arts and Ron's uh, comments. Yes. Uh, yeah. We would uh, revisit our site plan set uh, to the extent that we can address the comments without incurring any more uh, impact within the wetland buffer. Uh, resubmit that to the planning board for consideration of uh, an amended site plan right. approval. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Well, thank you. Thank yes, you. You're very welcome. Um, can you email me a copy of um, the letter? <coughs> Perfect. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Okay, the last two items are two referrals, uh, both from the town board. The waterfront, uh, Rycliffe Waterfront. Re Plant. We, uh, Melody and Art and I sat down and talked with them earlier tonight. Uh, you all have seen a copy, I hope, of that. I know they, they sent you the plan electronically. I know there's hard copy in the clerk's office. Um, in order, it, it, it's a similar situation, what they're proposing, what they're asking the town board to do. It's a similar situation to the Thomas Thompson Sally Mazzarella Park. It's in essence a master plan for development of the waterfront without any uh, plan at the moment to implement any of the specific aspects of that plan. But in order for the town board to adopt that plan, both Seeker and uh, RLWRP have to be uh, satisfied. And since there was no Seeker done, it makes it very difficult for the planning board to be able to make a recommendation on this particular uh, plan as to whether or not the town board should proceed. And someone has got to do Seeker for this. Uh, that has to happen. So what we have asked them to do is submit to us a long form EAF, uh, part one. Art will complete part two. I think it's basically going to be just a procedural thing. I can't see any way in the world that this thing is going to be any significant environmental impacts that would uh, require any further review beyond that. So that the, we're in a position, hopefully, to then recommend, when we recommend to the town board what to do with this, we can also recommend that they'll be lead agency under Seeker to give it a negative declaration. We also want to circulate it, and Ryan, there's a copy of the plan in Joni's office for you to look at and for this uh, uh, WAC to do a consistency review of this as well, because that will also be required. And you'll then be also giving a recommendation to the town board on what to do with this in terms of the consistency and the WAC, as well as as a CAB, you can also do that. So our hope is at our uh, December 15th meeting to be able to put this all together, have a recognition, and get it to the town board on what, what they, we feel they ought to do with this. I don't know if you have any questions about that. So, and it should be fairly straightforward. Uh, it's a Look to the plans. I think it's a great plan. Um, I think if they can actually, you know, over time implement it, I think it'll be terrific. Um, 
but there are just are steps we have to go through before we can adopt this to go forward with it. So the last item on our agenda is the referral of the affordable housing law. What about Claire Beaumont? Where? The ZBA. You got a, you got a oh. <coughs> okay, well, we'll do that first thing, get that out of the way. Yeah. Um, okay, this is an application for an area variance uh, to an accessory structure within required front yard and reduction in front setback from 100 to 15 feet and side setback from 15 to 28 feet for installation of residential generator on a 1.05 parcel in the RC5 district. This is that little, uh, if I recall, the Ann, Ann Drive is the one there by Camp Ramapo? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you know what the size of those lots are and, and what. Um, an, important, an important point that the uh, applicant is making here from the GPA is that our location um, the proposed location is uh, is mitigated visually by the presence of existing uh, vegetation. Uh, so the only thing I've included in the uh, draft recommendation, uh, uh, in the different, I mean, or additional, I mean, the draft recommendation for the planning board would be that uh, plan would recommend that uh, the ZBA actually include in its uh, approval some condition regarding the maintenance of that existing uh, vegetation. Good because point. if that existing landscaping is removed, uh, this thing is sitting right out, right out of stride the highway. <laughs> All right, I have a resolution here that I'll read. <coughs> the Town of Rhymick Planning Board has reviewed upon referral the application for area variance submitted by Claire Beaumont, Michael Conway agent, ZBA case number 875 in the matter of the proposed location of an accessory structure being a residential generator within the required front yard and reduction in front setback from 100 feet to 15 feet and side setback from 50 feet to 28 feet on a 1.04 acre parcel at 5 and Drive in the Rural Countryside RC5 District and comments as follows. One, the planning board finds the proposed work to raise no significant planning, zoning, or environmental issues. Two, the planning board recommends the ZBA both consider the board's observations and additionally rely upon its own study of the facts in deciding this application in accordance with the criteria and procedures set forth at Town Code Chapter 125, Sections 125-124C and D, including due consideration of the input of neighboring property owners. Three, in so doing, the planning board recommends the ZBA require the existing landscape screening described in the application be retained or enhanced. Could I hear a motion to approve? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Okay. The Aye. final. Yes. No. <laughs> we're nice we're never done. We're, it's just we just take a break, but we're never done. So, uh, what we did at our la at our special meeting on November third, we had a special meeting with members of the Open Space Affordable Housing Committee <coughs> to uh, present to us the uh, draft affordable housing law. And we did that in concert with the town board referring to us that law as it required under town zoning code for amendments to the zoning code. Uh, I believe that this is being proposed as an amendment to the zoning code and not a standalone law. That's my understanding, which is why it came to us for under that 60-day 60 um, 60-day requirement that we report back to them. At our meeting on uh, November 3rd, uh, I took notes. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank the members who helped me try to get them all together and sent them around to you. Those are the, the minutes of that meeting. What I did today was I just tried to take <coughs> those minutes and put them into some form of a discussion document for us to discuss and go over tonight so that we can, because I believe tonight is the last opportunity we have to make a recommendation to the town board um, before the 60 days is up, unless we were to schedule another meeting, which I know we very much do not wish to do. So, uh, the first part of this, uh, the first six items were just observations from the discussion with the uh, Open Space and Affordable Housing Committee. The other items, one through four, were things that we had discussed at that meeting and that were in those minutes. And the number five is something I was reading through the existing zoning law and the provisions under the affordable housing portion of that in section 12563D5 which goes into uh, the density bonus section. And in reading that, it seems to me, and we, I have it here, and he wants to look at it, mm -hmm. that the intent was that if we give a density bonus to any builder, it's expected that that builder will provide the affordable units within that, within that development that they're proposing. Uh, there are other aspects of our zoning law which speak to the inclusionary nature of how these units are supposed to be throughout the community, not just set aside somewhere, which is what we certainly tried to do with the gardens. Yes. Uh, sure. Uh, all the planning board members should have copies. Do you have copies? I don't have a copy. 
I think Joni handed them out to Do everyone. I have one in here somewhere? You should have one. Because <coughs> I know Joni did hand them out. Well, for starters, Sharon and I can look on and you Don't. do want to take one of these. Did you, did you find it, Richard? Sharon and I, I can it. share yeah, I and you can look tonight. at that. <coughs> All right, I'll go over these recommendations that we came up with at our meeting on the 3rd. The first, uh, an effort should be made to ensure that the draft law is consistent with the town's zoning law. There were some inconsistencies in terms of use of language, things of that sort. If it's going to be in the zoning law, we want to make sure that they're consistent, that we don't run into uh, areas where one part of the law contradicts another. Uh, number two, we discussed commercial development should be required to meet an affordable housing obligation. It was agreed that commercial development is the major component of development activities in the town, and any effort to raise sufficient funds to undertake affordable housing initiatives will not succeed if restricted to residential development in the town. And I, that was one thing I think that we wanted to discuss tonight. Um, I know a number of us feel that that's, feel strongly about that. Others may feel differently. We could, I'd like to have the, the especially this, I got the, a copy of those minutes, and that was an issue that Joe and I have talked about, and I think it really needs some clarification, because the way that, it, we certainly presented the minutes, and I think the way that conversation went, made it seem as if, if that was the takeaway, there was some piece of this, and we understood, and, and we looked at the chance to just explain why we actually feel that what we are proposing does meet these kind of obligations, and not obligations, but these kind of goals. Okay, well, it's really up to the planning board. Uh, it's not a public hearing. That's, that's what we had at the November 3rd meeting to discuss with you, and this is what we came away with. But uh, I have no objection to working with the members, with Joe and Jonathan. It's really up to the board as a whole, I think. I'd like to hear it, just because it was a big issue. And if, if you can shed some light on that and make us all realize where, how this will be funded and what our goals are. Yeah. to getting there that's all i need to know okay that it's that's feasible and i think that was our question i don't need to be part of this no. discussion no no i, I i'm not part <clears throat> of you know i don't need to be part of this discussion that's why i'm yeah uh, i, I know you're take, feeling a little my cold under the weather yeah. and, and yeah. go home uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well I, let me just i want to start by saying one thing well, this 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 all started in the context of the gardens and the first thing that the gardens contribution to what we have is a, a sort of initial trust fund We've got about three hundred thousand dollars that we have available right now that we can work with to provide workforce housing in Ryan County. We took a look at how many houses we built last year. It was it seven? I think was the total number of building permits. So to meet, you know, that in the course of what three years? That's if we're trying to meet a goal. That's two houses in three years. That's the kind of goal that we're looking at. And the cost of providing an affordable house is not the cost of building a new house. It's the cost between what a house could be either built or purchased for and what it would be sold for under a workforce housing program. So it's really just a spread. And when we went through this process with the gardens, it was around $30,000. So that stockpile of money that we have can go to buy a good number of houses, and that will carry us to some degree, that will carry us sort of a good deal into the future, just as a starting place, before anything else happens. The second piece is that on an ongoing basis, any area of higher density is gonna be funded by first an obligation, if it's in the R6000 district, that's the higher density district behind the hospital, it's included and it's mandated. The second is if somebody builds the higher density and senior floating zone, it's covered and it's mandated in that zone. Those are the two real high density development areas that exist. The third is that if it happens as part of a larger development, meaning 10 houses or more, somebody in all likelihood that would do a, de a development of that size would take advantage of the density bonus program. That density bonus program, the money that is received through that program, is more than adequate to cover the workforce housing costs for that development. And, and just by way of an example, so everybody understands the math of this thing, if somebody were to build, say, 20 houses, they're 4,000 square feet, just to keep the math easy because it's 25 cents a foot, every one of those houses would then provide $1,000 for the workforce housing program. There'd be 20 houses, that's $20,000. Take a look at the density bonus program. 4,000 square foot houses, 
there would be three of them. 15% is what we reduced it to actually at the request of some members of the planning board. We had originally, we talked about more to raise more money, but those three houses would generate $60,000 in fees that would go towards the workforce housing program. So three houses, $60,000. In that context, we have 20 houses, we've got, we've got $80,000 in total. That covers the spread between the cost to buy a house or build a house and what it would be sold for under the workforce housing program based on the experience that we had at the gardens. So in all of those situations, that 10% goal is being met. Where we would have a shortfall is with, in the context of individual single family houses that are just built by a single one out buyer. There's not that many of them. We've covered anything that would happen on a larger scale. So in terms of any shortfall that might exist in terms of individual single family houses, that's part of what we're looking to this kitty to help provide a mechanism to fund. And in part, this is not forever. We took a look at a lot of different options that had to do with taking a look at how can we possibly add some density in some of these areas. What we're being told very clearly from Dutchess County is that, Dutchess County planning, is that what we're up against is a self-created problem. Right? The town passed zoning that dramatically decreased the amount of density. That's made it very hard to build housing in, in, in a way that's not just affordable under the workforce housing program, it's affordable to anybody you know, that's on a market rate basis. I mean, you can only build stuff at a huge cost. That's the problem, right? So we have got, I think, and I think a lot of people in the committee agree with me, there are other things that we need to be looking at. What we were told pretty clearly is we shouldn't be doing that until the comp plan is up again. That's the context in which we should look at any of these things. And if we're gonna look also at any financing structures that involve a town-wide contribution to this program, meaning something that has to do with taxes, meaning something that has to do with the transfer tax, we were also advised that that is something that we should be looking to in the future, right? So, so what we're looking at is a scenario that gets us between here and some other things that we can consider as part of the next comp planning process. That's several years away. We have $300,000. We have large developments covered in a way that can provide the financing that would allow us to meet the 10% requirement for those developments. We also have the funding available that would allow us to meet the 10% goal. I wouldn't say requirement, the 10% goal that between now and when we can also start looking at some other possibilities. So that's something that, that, that it didn't seem was clear in the conversation that we had earlier, but I really wanted to make that clear to everyone tonight. And that's in a large part why this density bonus program was so important. That's why we were actually trying to expand it, because we saw it as a way to help provide more money for the kid that wouldn't involve taxes or wouldn't involve fees, you know, on a larger basis. So anyway, I, I want to I understand that. what you're saying. I don't quite see why, say we have a cluster development in the RC5 district. Someone has 200 acres, buildable acres, and therefore they're going to be able to build, you know, what, uh, 20, 40 units, something like that, whatever the math would be. And if they want a density bonus, there'll be another, however many more units that will be, about 15% of that on top of that. I don't see why collecting money from that person rather than requiring that within that development, it's going to be clustered, it's going to have to have central water and sewer, something like that. You're not going to be able to do well separation, septic, things like that for each unit. Why it is not more beneficial to have them build the, and designate the affordable units within that unit than create some other process of taking money from them to do it, which may or may not actually be enough depending on whatever the fee is. If you require them to build it, and they're building that many units, we want inclusionary units, so we would like to see them in a development like that. Why that is not a more straightforward and simple process than going through some more complicated mathematical process of trying to raise money when you have the developer right there, the builder, building of scale, obviously builders know the more units they build, the cheaper it is to build them. But They're going to have all the different facilities there to do it. Frankly, I don't see why using a fee-based schedule is superior to requiring that within a situation like that, they don't build the units. The, the key to understanding this is that right now, it costs a lot more to build than somebody can even sell something for. And under, under any of the sort of zoning that's outside of the R6000 or possibly that senior housing building zone. Right, so you're looking at, I mean, building housing right now is a money losing proposition, right? So you gotta understand that as a starting point. And that's something that we really spent a lot of time trying to get our hands around, right? So how do you do it? And a large part of that reason is that the zoning density 
is so limited. So the cost per unit becomes very, very high. So we're asking somebody to build something at a cost in which the spread between what it can be built for and what it will be sold for under an affordable housing program is big. And it's much, much more significant than it is in the context of buying an existing house and putting it in, as part of the workforce housing program. There's also the ability, if we have the fees, to buy something that would probably be closer to the village. That's some of what we're looking at, closer to transportation. That, to us, the ability to buy something much more cost effectively seems to us to be a much more reasonable approach to take than trying to man some, mandate something that somebody simply can't comply with economically. That's, and that's, that's where we're coming from. And, and I understand the idea that, that you know, in an abstract world, that, you know, I, I, hear, your, I hear where you're going with it. The problem is when you look at it in terms of what the economic reality is, it doesn't work. And we're trying to create a law we don't want to pass a law that we really feel nobody would be able to comply with because they simply can't. You know, it comes on top then of every other law that's been passed and it becomes a situation in which, okay, you know, you can pass legislation that say that, you know, pigs should fly to the moon. They're not gonna. You know, if you, you passing legislation that isn't economically feasible, it doesn't make any sense. Well, it doesn't make any sense to me, quite honestly, Jonathan, if a developer who's building 30, 40, 50 units or something can't afford to build the affordable units within that development, I don't see how the money raised through this fund is going to be sufficient to subsidize purchase of units within that development to make them affordable to meet the... It, the wouldn't, it wouldn't be purchased within that development. I, mean, that's, I, that's I, I can, I mean, that, in a scenario where you have 40 units going up, if they're $800,000 a piece, what is an affordable housing a unit going to cost someone? Then they're going to have to build something that's less than $800,000 a piece. The that, whole that idea takes is the whole to be defeats the whole development. I have a high-end housing, which people want, and now all of a sudden they're going to put a $100,000 unit on the end? Well, that's what's, but that's what's required, or they can build they it can. somewhere else. I, I don't agree with that. But that's unrealistic. That's not realistic. The city of New York is going through that with this one rock high rise down here where they've got, they decided to put a separate entrance in for the affordable housing <laughs> thing. And they have a riot on their hands. What do you mean I can't walk in the front door? Just I, I, I think it's feasible to, to offer affordable housing without it having to be smack in the middle of this new complex. It's just a matter of how do you do it, that's all. So how do you fund it and how do you do it? Where are yeah. you going to, exactly, where are you going to put it? I have not seen an implementation plan to show me well, where I mean, it's going to happen. One of the big points someone brought up last time was the, the, the transportation factor. Thinking workforce, labor force, housing, some people don't drive. Some people want access to public transportation and sure. everything, and that is going to be towards the center, the village, as opposed to somewhere like out at the uh, rock ledge there. But that's what I want, Richard, that's what I want to see. I want to see some sort of an implementation plan that tells me where this is going to happen. Right now, we're talking about raising money, we're talking about having a kitty of money, but I, at least, I have not seen any description of where it's going to go, how it's going to go, how you're going to go about going about buying is where you're even looking at. It seems to me before you start raising money for something, you have to have some idea what you're going to spend it on. It's going to be a moving target, though. I mean, it's going to be... But don't you think you should have to have one. some idea first of where you're going to move towards before you start raising money for it? I mean, don't you I think, think they've said a couple of times that, that the goal is to, to possibly take and renovate and purchase and rent because the renting seems to be a much more uh, an easier way oh, I assume to do it probably is. I'd like to know where. I'd like to have at least some idea of you where. You've got to start someplace. Yes, you and do, and to start can I, someplace. Can I, can I finish the sentence? Actually, Joe, I'm the chairman of this committee, so if you wish to speak, yes, you can be, you can be recognized. I was speaking at that point. Yes, you have to start someplace. What I'd like to see is where you're going to start. And just raising money, to me, is not where you're going to start. Everything else we've done in this community, we have had plans, such as we're doing for the Rhinecliffe Waterfront. They don't know where they're going to do it. They don't know where the money's going to come from. They have the plan first. The Thompson Mazzarella Park had the plan first. Now we're going to try to raise the money. Everything we try to do, we at least have some idea, some plan of how we're going to do it and where we're going to do it before we start asking people to give money to it. That's what I'm asking for, and I don't see that here. We were, we were advised by Dutchess County that no developers will seriously speak to you unless you have a pot of money uh, as to whether you're going to do rehabilitation or whether you're going to buy uh, 
uh, something with what is in the kitty. Uh, so that, uh, as I say, we got to start with something so we can talk to uh, developers about rehabilitation. With respect to getting money on single family house or two family, because I don't think there's a lot of big developments coming Probably along not. the 40 uh, houses in an R5. That what you're trying to get is that delta between a market price and the affordable pro price. Because if you get enough of those, say you have 10 single family houses, you may achieve that delta for one affordable unit someplace. Uh, so I think that was missing from our initial uh, discussion that what we're really talking about is raising money from that delta because if you build an affordable house, you're still gonna be able to sell it for something and the person will be able to get a uh, uh, mortgage, so that's what we didn't want you to. Uh, and what, yeah, what we're doing is we're we're, t we're talking to we're talking to different uh, Hudson River Housing is one, and they'll actually we've been advised that we should the town should not own the property, but we can work with a private non for profit group that would own and manage the property. And what that would involve would be a scenario in which the town would be responsible for as Joe was saying, bridging the gap between what a house could be bought for. And you can buy a house now for, in Rhinebeck for $225,000. You know, we've looked at the listings and there's a lot that's available at a much lower price point. And that's, that's the difference between being able to buy something at that kind of price. In a lot of cases, it involves much less land and saying to somebody, well, you've got to build it, you know, on the equivalent of, of 10 acres of a property with a big land cost, a huge infrastructure cost, and a huge building cost to come out of the ground on it where you get into that stuff and that ha it's not buying a house for $250,000, building a house and with building costs are more than a half a million dollars. And that's where it becomes, it, it becomes, it starts to feel like it's not fair to ask somebody to go and do that and subsidize that big of a gap. Well, when as, 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 as a committee and as a town, we could make a purchase on something that's much less expensive and then just bridge that gap between what that purchase price would be and what that unit would be worth under our program. Well, then there would be two points I would make. <clears throat> First of all, the garden came to us offering to do the affordable housing. We didn't have to go to them. They volunteered to do that. So, you know, there are developers out there who are more than willing to do that. And the it's one important. big development we now have, well, what other big developments have we had in the last 10 years here? That's the only one. And they volunteered to do that. The second thing is if you're not talking about a kitty of money, it seems to me we've all agreed, I think, the commercial development really is the major development engine in this community, and it's probably likely to stay that way. To not include them in raising these funds seems to me to be irresponsible, because obviously housing prices are gonna go up. If you're gonna buy houses to rehabilitate them, that's not always as inexpensive as starting from scratch. Some houses need a great deal more work to bring them up to code, given when they were built. So not including commercial seems to me to be a mistake because you're not going to raise the money. But we're talking about, we'll, we'll, let's talk about things one at a time. The, the, first, the first point though, uh, in terms of the, of, the, of the gardens, the gardens is built in a very high density area, right? That's, that is the equivalent of our R6000. That's the equivalent of the senior, the senior housing floating zone. In both of anything that's like the gardens, those are the only examples that are like the gardens. Everything else is very low density. Uh, so we're, we're talking about apples to oranges in the context of the gardens in five acre, 10 acre, 20 acre districts. In the areas that are high density, we mandate it. We said that not only do you have to build it on site, you've got to build it. It's not, it's not an option. So in anything that's like the gardens, we require. Um, and to compare the gardens, you know, the, oh, in the gardens they can do it, well, that means in a, in a 20 acre district they can do it. You know, totally and utterly different sets of scenarios. And commercial, you know, the concern that we've had was a couple things. I mean, and I, I feel myself like I'm, I'm conflicted on this. So I don't, I really don't want to, I don't, I, I would have prefer to have other committee members talk about it. I know that there's concerns about a scenario in which, um, in which people that are trying to start a business, which is really a, a sort of a, a, a problem with the sort of economic situation up here, there's, you know, creating out, people creating opportunities for themselves. And jobs are a big deal. We didn't 
want to create a situation in which it was harder and more expensive for people to do that. 90% um, of the, the job of, of the businesses in this area are small businesses, and we didn't want to be in a position where we were creating an additional burden. Um, there was also a discussion around how taxation works for commercial properties versus residential properties. Commercial properties being very much cash flow positive from a from a tax perspective. There's a lot of payment that goes into a municipality from commercial buildings. Not a lot of services that get used. So the the dynamic between residential taxes and commercial taxes is very very different to begin with. And there are a lot of advantages by having more commercial development, frankly, than we probably have now uh, to help the tax base in the long term. All of this was stuff that was discussed. But I, I, as I said, I don't. I really do feel conflicted on this particular Well, it issue. seems to me perhaps unfair to say that the small business, and most of the businesses coming in here tend to be a little bit larger than that, would be perhaps burdened by having to pay into this fund, whereas, you know, some young couple just bought a piece of property, they want to build a house, and they're going to be burdened by having to pay an extra fee to into an affordable housing fund. So where's the fairness there? It seems to me that any member of this community wishes to participate in this community, to benefit from this community, businesses come to this community because of what Rhinebeck has to offer. We have a lot here to offer them. They want to be here. Why shouldn't they help to pay for some of the needs that we have in this community, such as affordable housing? All the rest of us do. It's similar to parents who don't have children pay school taxes because it's important to all of us that our children be educated for the next generation, whether they have children or not. It's an obligation we all need to meet. And I don't see why different people coming in, using our community, using the services of our community, using the good name of our community, should not also be required to contribute to what this community needs, such as affordable housing. I don't see the fairness there in, well, in keeping there's, commercial there's, there's out. Already, there's already an inequity in terms of what commercial is being asked to contribute in terms of taxes. And with a, with a residential house, you're not saying, you know, this can only be lived in by, by a, a childless couple. No, you're not. But with so, a commercial person, they're here to make money from this community. The people living here are just coming here to live here, to contribute to the community. They usually don't make money from it. They're actually contributing to it and to the different services required, such as schools and things like that. It just seems to me anyone who wishes to benefit from what this community offers, and it offers a great deal, mm -hmm. should be willing to contribute to meeting the needs of the community. If I could add something. In drafting uh, this, the committee used as a model, that was the chapter 63 that was in the uh, zoning law. Uh, that chapter sets an outline. It wasn't used totally, some changes were made. But one of the things was that uh, you could either pay an in lieu of fee, and with two in lieu of fees, we made it one in lieu of fee, depending on the number of uh, 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 units, whether I think it was up to three or five, one fee, a different fee, now it's the uh, uh, same fee. Um, so, you know, if you want to abandon that plan totally uh, and say, hey, that was really pretty stupid to uh, allow a, uh, a fee instead of mandatory construction. I guess you can do it, but, uh, you know, there is some respect, I think, for laws that have been passed and models uh, uh, that were done. So, um, you know, think about that as to whether you have to have mandatory construction uh, as opposed to, beside the economic arguments, there is a certain respect of uh, what what was done in the comprehensive plan. Oh, well, and in the zoning law. And Pardon me? And in the zoning law, actually, what you're referring to, the section yeah, of the zoning law. Yeah, it's in the zoning law. And in the zoning law, under the density bonus section, it does not talk about in lieu of fee. It talks about mandatory yeah. well, that, construction that, that, of be, the affordable be, yeah, units. We were told we very clearly by the town board and by, you know, Dodd's on our committee. He was involved with the, that entire process. That was thrown in at the very end of it in the context of the town board not realizing that they needed to get something passed and that they hadn't put nearly enough thought into the affordable housing ramifications of some of the zoning that they were passing. This was something that came into the mix <coughs> towards the end of that process and none of them felt comfortable 
around what had been considered as part of that law, which is why they formed our committee so we could really take a look at it. And we've like we have struggled with this thing for years. Oh, I know. And, you and, and, I, and, I, and the other thing too, and I'm not I, as I said, I, I really don't want to be the person that argues ultimately any kind of merits about commercial. I'm just I'm not the right person to do it. Um, I I but. We, we went through, we went by what was in a lot of existing affordable housing regulations that we looked at, um, and everything was residentially based, and that was where, our, that's where our head's been at for that reason. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're reacting to all of the different stuff that we've been looking at, you know, both regionally and then in a bunch of different states. So it was all residential to residential, and, and that's how the structure worked. Um, so we do, we haven't, it, that it hadn't been some place. I don't think the gardens is really an appropriate model for us to even look at though because we had uh, so many things went on they want oh, to go in there and they get their money the town wanted to get rid of that blight yeah. the town passed a local law to accommodate them to say we went from three thousand down to one thousand per unit because they had existing recreational facilities on site in exchange uh, they were more than happy to say you know what we'd like to put some money into that and oh we also got a waiver on a right-of-way for a trail system right through their property uh, that in lieu of that they made a donation to the recreation fund mm -hmm. so way too much happened with them uh, it, it, I think it worked out in the end best for the town it's and for them well. but not a good example at all though, well I think it's Portland. a good example that here was a developer who volunteered who they offered they volunteered for a reason to do it for perhaps, a reason. perhaps but they volunteered to do it they were not asked volunteered to with an incentive yes there's always an incentive in any commercial enterprise. Well, well that's what we're trying to get at. What's the incentive where are we going for someone? With this tonight? Me, we need to make me, a recommendation. Let me interject something here. We're talking in circles. My suggestion is we have some recommendations, including the ones that you've voiced. I think it's the town board's privilege, and they'll do it anyway. Absolutely. To take those recommendations and either tear them up or work with them, depending on how they feel. And I think we're just talking in a big circle here now. So Thank you, my Mike. suggestion is hand over the suggestions to the town board and let them deal with it. They're going to deal with it anyway. That's their job. I agree, but I think we need to agree on what we want to hand over to them. That's the point tonight. I think we already had. I well, let me, let me, I wasn't at the meeting, so let me ask a question. Those of you who were there, do, 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 is what Michael's drafted, does this reflect your discussions of that night, and was that the consensus of the people who were here yeah. at the meeting? Number five doesn't. Number five I added. I yes. thought that was something about what density bonuses. That was about density bonuses. That if you're ever getting a density bonus, you should be mandated, as the law currently requires, to construct the units. Right. And number two, I don't think it's fair to say it was agreed by both the members of the OSHA and members of the planning that commercial development dominates development activities in Rhinebeck. I don't ever remember saying anything about commercial development dominates, and I don't agree Where with that. Where does it say that? Uh, two on page one. How would oh, you, two on page how would you one. care to rephrase that? I think that? commercial development is a factor. You don't think it's the dominant factor in, in current development activities in the town? Can we change the word dominant to primary? Uh, okay. Primary is what? What are we talking about? The restaurants? Semantics, sure, guys. Restaurants, bank, medical building. His project. Like yeah, his project okay. is commercial. I mean, again, you don't want to get in the yeah. middle of it, but... Which I understand why you don't. Yeah, I really don't. I really don't. That commercial I development, what are you saying? Well, let me just point primary? out, and I'm not arguing for commercial or not, but the model in the zoning law that was passed was residential only. Right, and, and I, I think it's fair to mention it, but there's no need to say whether it dominates or it's the primary thing. The question to the town board should be, why aren't we considering imposing some kind of fee on commercial renovation and or building? That's all. That's Bring it to their attention, let them make the decision. Yeah. I prefer, my own personal preference was I feel, I would prefer to recommend it to them because I feel it's a more fair, equitable way to spread the uh, need or the ability to do affordable housing throughout the community. But as, as Jonathan mentioned, these guys have been debating this thing for years and all the technical recommendations from the quote professionals out there are saying stay away from commercial. So they're, they're closer to it and have gotten more information based on what he's telling us. So. Well, that's the sort of thing we can decide tonight. Do we want to leave that in there or not? That's the whole point. This is a draft. This is not 
I would say, I would say suggest to the town board that they review the commercial aspects of it. Again, it's their responsibility. All we're doing is looking at what we think is the law. I agree with that. I like that. <coughs> what so are the how are you? I think number two should just simply read and the members of the planning board uh, feel that the town board, town of Rhinebeck, uh, town board should consider the commercial element and contribute, contributing to these fees. That's all. And we let them deal with it. That is number two on page one. <laughs> number two on page one. Number two on page one. All right, so you're, you're suggesting striking from it was agreed by both members out and inserting your... Your comments? I don't think we need to add, it was agreed by both. It's a very simple statement that says the members of the planning board feel that commercial fee, uh, the, the gain we can get by adding commercial fees into this affordable housing. Should be reconsidered? Should be considered. Should be considered. Yeah. All right. So that's. And you looking to. I need to see it. Are you looking to simultaneously um, amend the language in two on page two? You, I heard you um, questioning whether it was agreed that commercial development is the major component. Did I hear you say that earlier? That's correct. Okay. So unless someone wants to offer so, me some, so you're hard suggesting numbers. a reworking of that. As well, that I think we're getting tied up in our knickers here, folks. Yeah. Well, what I'm trying to do is, is yeah. Well, the I mean, here. obviously, yes. I mean, it says exactly what I just said. I don't agree with. So, I mean, what is it we're trying to say? Number two on page two. I think you're saying the same exact thing. thing. Yes, but I think. You know, the, the first page, if I'm following Michael, one through six are observations. Right. And then he moves from those observations into recommendations. recommendations. And number two, we would be read exactly the same. Okay. That's what I'm trying yeah, to no, clarify. I, I think so. So are there other parts of this, either on the first page or the second page, that you uh, Yeah, I don't agree. Not? I don't agree with number five. I, you know, which that's five, fine. It's an opinion. You can certainly change it's it to say some members, it's but page two. I don't think. I think it's very hasty for us to sit there and say we're going to require builders to put those units because I don't feel like we've uh, considered all the different scenarios that could occur, uh, and nor have we considered all the benefits uh, and how it can be implemented because we don't really have a real plan of attack. That's right. We don't. Granted. But, right. as Joe said, we've got to pull the trigger somewhere, so maybe the question is we would like, in lieu of this, we would like a more detailed approach to what it is, we're, how we're going to spend these monies. Well, we would recommend that a more detailed approach be developed. It's sure. not up to us to like or want. Right. That's, a, that's my point, though. Right. We, so we're, rec we're saying <clears throat> it would be helpful if a more detailed approach was developed. I mean, this is what we're saying, right? Yeah. Joni, are you getting this not down? necessarily Good. for our review. No, definitely not for our review. That's why she's restating what I said. She's saying our recommendation is we feel if, that. There it would be. be useful if there were a more blah, 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 blah. All right. And you Those, go ahead. Uh, Vex, the question I have here is this is a recommendation to the town board mm -hmm. on the draft affordable housing law. So your feeling is, at least I'm getting the feeling from you, Richard, that you feel we should recommend they approve it and then hope down the road that some sort of implementation plan, some sort of thing is developed. Is that? No. We're, we're giving no. comment on... We're giving comments on their proposed law. I think there are a couple aspects of it that are very shaky. Well, that's what, that's what I'm asking. Okay, are you recommending so no, them? I do not recommend that they approve it because it's still not ready. So I'm not going to hand you a million dollar loan and say, you come back to me and tell me how you're going to spend it, Michael. I'd like to have some kind of game plan to say, perhaps a couple scenarios, perhaps a piece of real estate that's on the market today. What could we do and how would we implement those monies? And how would we go about how many families could that set up? And that money came from where? So we feel like we have that, that balance 
mm -hmm. with affordable housing. So in other words, you and I actually agree on the point that we need to see something specific about how this plan is going to go forward before we're comfortable with approving something that's going to be raising money. And, and again, it's we're just we're not approving we're anything. Approving anything. No, we're just giving our recommending. But let me, Reco our recommendation is. Do we have a time <coughs> ticking on this? Yes, we do. We I think do. this is our last And this is our last opportunity to, to to clarify what we're saying back. We, right. we are obligated to respond to them in a timely fashion. Correct. So we need to complete, you know, we'll, where's Art when we need him writing and editing? Oh, no, this is good. <laughs> this is good. It's a critique of, the, of, of their proposal. And they get to do with, it, do with it as they will. Okay, but, will. We've made, we, but they we, will. we've made some changes here, which we, yeah. we understand will be part of our vote when we take it in the minute or two. Mm -hmm. um, could I could I also recommend that we um, somewhere uh, at the beginning or at the end um, acknowledge the hard work that's gone on by this committee? Oh, sure. Um, because we don't have that in here, and I think it is fair to say um, that they've put a lot of time and effort into it, and I hear Jonathan talking about struggling with the same issues that we're struggling with and you know it hasn't been easy for them to come to resolution so i i would like us to start out by acknowledging the hard work Absolutely. of the committee i think that's a good idea um and i don't care if, let's just say we say it at the beginning and you know that these are right and that these are these are comments and suggestions um that that we too would like to see considered is that so i guess what i would just ask is we have to make a recommendation to what they are going to approve the town board. Are we saying that we feel these following things should be looked at and considered prior to and potentially amend this draft law before it's adopted by the town board? We're, I, think we're, I think we're recommending that the town board take a look at these issues we've raised and then they will make their own determination. Yeah, I don't feel we have the need to recommend anything officially. I think we need to make some comments. Actually, we can say these are our comments. Richard, we actually do have to do it officially. It's required by the law. No, but we can make these recommendations. We're not recommending that they adopt or not adopt as written. We're saying this is our review and these are the recommendations we're making back. Is that correct? That sounds like what you're going for. So in other words, we're not really giving a recommendation on the law itself, whether we feel it should be adopted or not adopted. No. I don't understand the problem. I mean, I just want to understand that that's what we're doing. We don't have to respond to them at all. Well, if we don't respond to them, then it is taken as a recommendation we, to adopt the law. Yeah, no. I, I, I so remember that, so that the way is some of our so, crazy laws So written. that is what that recommendation is. Then we are recommending they adopt the law as presented to us. We're going in the circles again. That's why I'm just asking, what is it that we wish to send back to the town board? A recommendation that they just look at and not recommend whether they adopt or don't adopt the law as it was presented to us? Well, your last, your last comment here is, is the recommendation of the planning board that these modifications to the draft affordable housing law be made prior to adoption of the law by the town board. Um, and I don't think that that's the feeling of the, of the, town, of the planning board. I hear us saying more something like it is the recommendation of the planning board that, that these modifications be considered prior to adoption of the law by the town board. Bingo. That's what I think we are saying. And then you don't wish to make any recommendation on the adoption yeah. of the law itself. Correct. We don't have to. And by doing so, we do not come across as, in, uh, as approving nor disapproving. No, I agree. I agree. As we simply are giving a report with our recommendations. Have a report. You're right. As long as we have a report, that's right. correct. And, and then, I just want to make sure that that's what everybody wants to and do. And then we would be in that paragraph striking the last part, which is in the absence of these modifications, the planning board finds that the goals will not be attainable, et cetera. Right. You have to so strike that all would of be that. Stri Anything stricken. that would recommend approval or disapproval of the affordable housing law should be stricken. Does everybody know what we just did? <laughs> I think we do. So when does this have to be given to them? We, we're going to vote. We have to we vote, have to vote okay. tonight. This is our last night. So let, let me see if They're I... They're standing there waiting for All right, so we're looking at... <laughs> so we, we have inserted at the beginning uh, um, acknowledgement of the hard work of the committee. And, yes. you know, appreciation for their work and acknowledgement of what what they've undertaken and, and you know, applause for taking on the good cause. Um, we've amended 
uh, on the first page, number two, um, which was, which basically stops after the first sentence. Correct, Richard? Is that what we Correct. And strikes the remainder of that paragraph? Right. And then we jumped to number two on page two. To make that consistent. Make that consistent. Um, and we, we, did, we dropped the word required. Commercial development should be considered. Is that right? Correct. I think between you and Johnny we'll get this. And it strikes the remainder of that? Yes. And the rest of the document, say, and, and then you're striking, as we just said, the... Um, and item number five, I don't think the planning board's in agreement with that. Right. The density bonuses. Strikes number five, and um, uh, it is the recommendation of the planning board that these modifications to the draft affordable housing law be considered prior to adoption of the law by the town board. Something, yes. Is that... Did I get it all? Here, I think so. the rest of that's strict. Would you ask for a motion? Yes, I would. <laughs> so moved. Second. Any further Second. discussion? I suppose I should pull the board. Pull the board. Richard? Aye. Woody? Aye. Sharon? Aye. Melody? Aye. And I'll vote aye. Thank you. All right. <laughs> now that we're thoroughly confused. <laughs> Okay. Thank, you for, thank you for staying. Oh, yeah, that's good. I enjoyed that one point. And, and I really just want to be clear that, especially the how do you meet this thing in terms of costs, and uh, this is that's the stuff we spent a lot of time looking at. It's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky no, I, I, I don't doubt it for a minute. Yeah. I, don't doubt it for I a minute. think, we we, you know, we, as we were working through the historic preservation draft, you know, we tried to create some scenarios that people could understand how it would work. And, you know, maybe that's an approach yeah. you can also consider. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, could I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Second. Second. Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you, friends.